what we're going to be talking about today, we'll go over several different things. One is, you know, what does anxiety typically look like? What are the uh, people who are diagnosed with anxiety typically experiencing by the time that they come here? We'll go over different specific diagnoses for different folks, such as uh, OCD, social anxiety, generalized anxiety disorder, panic disorder. And we'll talk about what that looks like in school. How does it come up for folks day to day over and above kind of the, uh, the pop psychology perception of what these things typically look like? And I'm going to talk about some specific coping skills that you can use in the classroom with your guidance counselor or even during e-learning to help manage these thoughts, these feelings, these things that are coming up to help you be the most successful in school as possible. By the time people come to our clinic, they've typically got ways of thinking about the world and interacting with the world that they've been using for quite a while to help lower their distress, lower their anxiety. So if somebody comes in and they've got social anxiety, they're typically worried about what other people might be thinking about them, that they might feel embarrassed or humiliated in a particular situation. And so one of their go-to strategies might be to avoid those situations where they'd worry about what other people think. And by the time they come to us, the things that they're doing to lower their anxiety are getting in their way even more than the anxiety itself. So they might be uh, avoiding all uh, different social interactions with friends or with family uh, that they were previously very, very close to and wanting to see. So when it comes to our work at Rogers, we work to teach our patients um, how to tolerate that anxiety, how to sit with it, how to not do those behaviors that might end up being unhelpful, like avoiding, even though it's a very natural thing to do when you feel anxious about something. You see a spider, you want to get away from it. You walk up in front of a class to give a presentation, you might want to run out the door. And that makes sense. Anxiety often makes sense. But when we do those behaviors that can lead to us not doing the things we need to do or not doing the things we used to like to do, like Dr. DeYoung was saying, that's when we want to learn to use some coping skills and tolerate our anxiety. One of the skills that I teach a number of my patients is called Ride the Wave. It's a very fun name for essentially waiting out your anxiety. We know here at Rogers that most emotions last about seven to nine minutes unless they get re-triggered by something. So that means when you're sitting in the classroom and you're getting nervous, if you ride the wave and ride your anxiety up to the peak and then back down, it will get better. It's important to say that many of our different treatments here at Rogers involve us kind of approaching a situation that we would normally want to avoid and dropping these things that we call safety behaviors. So safety behaviors are things that we might do in the moment that will lower our anxiety pretty quickly, but ultimately uh, it's gonna be counterproductive. Those safety behaviors are going to teach us that the thing that we're worried about is dangerous. They're going to teach us that we need to do them in order to feel better. And it's going to teach us that they're actually uh, keeping us safe, right? This is uh, the equivalent of me saying that the reason why I haven't been uh, struck by lightning when I'm walking to my car is that I'm wearing my lucky socks. And chances are there are other explanations for why I haven't been struck by lightning when I'm walking to my car. And they're probably not that I've got some lucky socks on. Another skill that I teach my patients for managing safety behaviors is called urge surfing. So we can pretend we're on a surfboard, pretend you're riding that wave of anxiety until it peaks and gets better. And once it gets better, you're not going to feel the need to do that safety behavior, whether it's avoiding or wearing your lucky socks or um, doing a ritual before a test, um, going to the bathroom, staying homesick when you're worried about something coming up at school. If you get away from that urge, you can ultimately do the thing that feels impossible in that moment. I think one thing to be aware of is the different ways that anxiety can kind of come up for people uh, day to day. And so I think it's important for us to go over uh, what this typically looks like for kids, both so if you guys happen to be experiencing any of these uh, thoughts or any of these physical sensations that we can tell you it's normal. These are things that we see in our clinic all the time. And I think too, to tell teachers what to keep an eye out for uh, in terms of what people are experiencing in the classroom. 
one diagnosis that people typically experience is obsessive compulsive disorder. And this disorder involves intrusive thoughts where individuals will have these thoughts come into their mind. These thoughts can be strange. They can be the opposite of what your values might be, and they can seem pretty scary. And so usually the ways that these come up, we might see people have intrusive thoughts about being contaminated or not doing things correctly or having things have to be just so or having to check things repeatedly. There's lots of different ways that they can come up even over and above that. Uh, we can have people who have so-called scrupulosity related thoughts where they are thinking about uh, religion or needing to be a very good or a very moral person. We have folks have intrusive harming or sexual thoughts, which are very, very common, just like cleaning or washing or checking might be. And I think that's a very, very important point to underscore. These thoughts can come up just as often as the others. Uh, typically, in school, we might see that uh, this gets connected uh, to things like perfectionism. You know, you might have difficulty with doing your homework in a particular way because you're having a thought that says that's not right or it's not perfect. I've worked with folks that uh, they've got a lot of perfectionism, but on the surface, it might not look like it because they they would be willing to uh, not turn their homework in. They'd be willing to skip assignments because it's easier for them to be certain that they would get a zero for a particular assignment rather than roll the dice and see if they would get something like a 98, which to them would seem terrible. We know that folks are also socially anxious. So these people typically, they feel very, very self-conscious. They might avoid other people or they might avoid social situations. Uh, these are the folks that might have a tough time uh, being up at the board or answering questions. Uh, they might have uh, a difficult time being around uh, even their friends or classmates or even family because they're worried what other people are going to think of them. Typically, we'll see folks sitting alone at lunch. We would wonder, you know, are they anxious about what other people might be thinking about them? Is it hard for them to answer questions in class? Uh, and do they kind of hang out by themselves a little bit more than the average person does? We also see a diagnosis called generalized anxiety disorder. This typically boils down to people asking, well, what if? People will typically worry about things that are focused in the future, and they'll spend a lot of time trying to prepare for dealing with these consequences that they're worried about. And so they spend a lot of time thinking about it. It feels very, very productive to them, like they're planning for what they need to do. But ultimately, we feel like they're spinning their wheels because the things that they're worrying about either are things that they are probably going to be able to handle or things that might not happen anyway. So they end up spending a lot of time worrying about this stuff and then they end up not having to deal with it. So these are folks that typically they're, they're worried about uh, things that might be happening later. They, so they'll typically ask friends or family or teachers uh, the same questions over and over again. Right? Do you think that this is going to happen? Was this okay? Things like that. And so if you're finding that you're asking people or teachers, if you're finding that your students are asking you the same questions over and over again, almost verbatim, they might have generalized anxiety disorder. Sometimes people have uh, worries about the physical sensations that go on in their bodies, so-called panic disorder. People will worry about having a panic attack. And these are the folks that typically have a lot of physical complaints while they're in school. They might have headaches, stomach aches, they might get dizzy, they might feel nauseous, and that's typically connected to them feeling anxious. So these are the folks that uh, a lot of the time feel like they need to go to the nurse's office or they need to go to the counselor's office because they're not feeling very well and that feeling is connected with the anxiety that they might experience. They might also think that they've got something physically wrong with them and they would want to get checked out. When you're experiencing some of these different things, because everybody feels some of these things, thinks some of these things, and experiences some of these things at different parts of their life, it's normal. When these things are coming up, you can use those behavioral skills that I mentioned, urge surfing and riding the wave to resist doing your safety behaviors, to resist going to the nurse's office, to resist checking up on symptoms, to resist looking things up when you're wondering what if. When it comes to the thoughts, I like to teach my patients to use thought diffusion. So thought diffusion is a skill in which you can practice looking at your thoughts 
as if they are clouds passing in the sky, as if they're leaves floating down a stream, as if there are cars driving down a highway. And you can truly envision them just passing by in your head, not judging them, not worrying about them, not getting caught up in them, and just letting them go. Because ultimately, thoughts are just thoughts, and they can't hurt us. Typically, kids who have anxiety, they can present in a lot of different ways. And this is something that uh, I think it's important to, to take a look at because people who are anxious tend to engage in these behaviors like we talked about before that they feel like are keeping them safe, but it's really taking them away from what they really need to do in their day-to-day -day life, like consistently uh, being in class or being able to interact with friends or family. And so I'd encourage uh, students and teachers to think, you know, am I using an anytime pass? very, very frequently to kind of stay out of school or make sure that I'm uh, not feeling judged by people? Am I going to the school counselor or going to the nurse very frequently because I'm worried about what might happen or I'm worried about physical sensations in my body? Some people have difficulty with being late to class uh, for a variety of reasons. Could be perfectionism. It could be fear that they're going to be judged. But this also can affect the folks that are in the class that are kind of hanging in the background, right? They're the kids that typically uh, don't avoid. They're kids that really want to participate and they're typically kind of quiet and they, uh, they typically can very easily be overlooked. And so I would ask teachers to keep an eye out for that and I would ask any students, if you're hanging back, are you doing it out of anxiety? Are you doing it because you feel like if you were to step forward, it would be too hard for you? While we want people to go to their counselors if they absolutely need to step out of the classroom, I want to talk about some skills that you can use in the classroom when you're back in school um, amongst your peers and your teachers, of course. So some things that I have heard patients say work really well because no one can know that you're doing them are different breathing exercises. You can do color breathing. Breathe in a color you like, breathe out a color you don't like. You can do square breathing. Breathe in for a count of four, hold for a count of four, out for a count of four, hold for a count of four, and do it all over again. You can do some different exercises looking around the room to find 10 things of a certain color. You can look around a room and play an alphabet game with yourself. Find something that starts with an A something that starts with a B, something that starts with a C. You can also do some muscle relaxation exercises. It can be very helpful to tense the muscles of your body and release them because you are engaging your muscles in that anxious tight feeling, but that release actually physically calms your body down, even though your head might still be running a mile a minute with thousands of thoughts. You can do it in the seat of your classroom and no one would know. Clench your toes together, clench your feet, clench your calves, your thighs, let it go. Go muscle by muscle, up your body, down your body, whatever works for you. If you ultimately do need to leave the classroom, that's okay. We encourage you to only leave for a couple of minutes though, because you don't want it to turn into one of those safety behaviors that Dr. DeYoung keeps talking about. So step out and get a drink of water from the water fountain. Go use the bathroom, go take one lap in the hall but come back in with the goal of facing your anxiety in that environment. If you do need to go to your school counselor because you're really anxious and you're almost feeling like a panic attack is coming on, some good skills for that are TIP, it's an acronym, stands for temperature. So you might want to grab an ice cube and put it on the back of your neck. You might want to bend down and splash cold ice water on your face. You can do some intense exercise, that's the I. Do some push-ups, do some jumping jacks, some crunches, run on the track, get those muscles going, get those feelings out. You can also do paced breathing, one of the P's, similar to our square breathing, and progressive muscle relaxation, the exact same trick that I taught you to use in the classroom. TIP, with all of those letters of the acronym together, can be so helpful in working through those intense feelings of anxiety and even if you're having some distressing thoughts to, to hurt yourself, to engage in some self-harm, some anger coming up, TIP is really good for that too. Another skill that's good for 
difficult feelings, maybe self-harm urges, maybe that anger, maybe feeling like you want to lash out on someone or you just feel like you need to hit something. The STOP skill, another acronym. The S is for STOP, so literally STOP. Then T, take a step back. O, observe the situation. P, proceed mindfully. Decide what do I want to do in this scenario? What do I want to do right now in this moment? And what is actually going to be more helpful for me long term? We want to make sure that as people are experiencing anxiety, one of the best things that we can have you do is challenge that uh, kind of feeling or desire that you might have that getting the heck out of there is going to be the best possible solution. And so I will typically have people try if they are uh, ready, willing and able to if they are anxious to rate their anxiety on a scale. We typically use a scale of one to seven where a one is zero anxiety and a seven is the worst panic attack you've ever had in your life. And so as people are in class, if you're feeling anxious, I'd encourage you jot down the level of anxiety that you're experiencing and see what happens as you attempt to challenge yourself to remain in that situation. Typically what we see is as people challenge themselves to stay in that situation, that their anxiety tends to go down. And what we find is people who keep doing this consistently, you'll see your anxiety go down a bit more and it will go down a bit more quickly. So usually if folks are experiencing an anxiety level of say one through four, we would encourage you stay in that classroom, make sure that you are as engaged as you can be. If your anxiety is up above that, uh, maybe say a, a five or so, you can step out for a moment, splash some water on your face, take a quick walk, but the important thing will be to get back in as soon as you possibly can. If you're at a six or you're at a seven, that's typically when we recommend that you're using these coping skills that we're going over here. And if you do step out, that you'd step out for about 15 minutes or so, and then you'd come back. So a fun coping skill to kind of go along with everything that Dr. DeYoung was also just saying, it's called opposite action. So when your anxiety is telling you to do a safety behavior, to stay home from school, to fake sick because the test is coming up, to go to the nurse's office, to um, engage in a ritual, whatever it may be, think, is this my anxiety talking or is this me talking? If it sounds like it's something your anxiety is telling you to do, try to do the opposite. Go to school, face that test, open your book and study. You will ultimately end up more successful doing that than doing those safety behaviors that feel really good in the moment, but are very unhelpful in the long term. I want to make sure that uh, the teachers out there as well uh, understand one of the best things that you guys can do to support your students in the best way that we know how is to notice that they're anxious, to communicate between you, the social workers, school psychologists, your students and their families, and to let them be anxious. I know that uh, as, as a parent, the last thing in the world that I want is for my daughter to be anxious. And I know all of the teachers that I've spoken to over the years, the last thing that they want are for their students to be anxious. And unfortunately, what tends to happen is very well-meaning people in very well-meaning ways try to quickly remove people's anxiety. And I think it's the most natural thing in the world to do that. But we want to make sure that we're not inadvertently reinforcing it by having folks avoid and then having them teach themselves that that is what's going to make them feel better rather than that they can handle it. Uh, if they are anxious. So we want to make sure that teachers and students are on the same team where uh, students are going to be allowed to be anxious, but they're not going to avoid, they're not going to distract, and they're not going to seek reassurance. And last thing for you students, your job is to talk to your teachers. Tell them how you're feeling. Tell them what's coming up. Talk to your school counselor, your school nurse, your um, principal, whoever you're close with at school, and let them know what's going on for you. They can't know that you're struggling sometimes unless you tell them. So even though it might make you nervous in that moment to go to them to say something, that's what we're telling you all about today, to face that anxiety, to take that step and do what you need to do to help yourself. A um, couple more ideas if you're in e-learning. 
because it can be harder to reach out to your teachers. Send an email, send a chat, make a separate meeting for you and your teacher or you and your guidance counselor, your social worker to work through some of these things. All of the concepts that Dr. DeYoung mentioned are exactly the same at home as they are in the classroom. We don't want to walk away from the computers if there's a class that's anxiety provoking. We don't want to not reach out to our teachers if we're having a hard time or struggling with an assignment. The communication is extra important these days that we're not in the classrooms together. During e-learning, all of these skills can work. You can do the same breathing exercises, muscle exercises, cold water exercises that I discussed. I would say the biggest thing is take care of yourselves. Get sleep, get off the screens in the evenings and the afternoons, get some exercise, go run around your yard in between classes and do what you need to do to get through these times for yourself because they are difficult and we hear you. We want to make sure that anybody who's experiencing any of the things that we've talked about uh, so far feels comfortable to reach out to their parents uh, and their teachers to get the help that they need. So we want to make sure that we are uh, very clear that we're here for you guys and that if anybody ever needs to come into our clinic and get some help, that they should. One thing that we know is that people who are anxious typically spend a very, very long time being anxious. The average person who's got an anxiety diagnosis dealt with it for a full decade, a full 10 years before they went to get help. So if you're finding that you're experiencing any of the things that we've talked about today, please do reach out to your parents, to your teachers, and they can connect you with us or with an outpatient therapist if need be to make sure that you get the help that you need. All of the things that we've talked about today are incredibly common, especially for folks your age. People typically worry, I'm the only person that's ever felt this way. I'm the only person that's ever felt this thought. And I can assure you, nothing could be farther from the truth. This is something that we see all the time in our clinic. And the earlier that people can work on any of these anxiety diagnoses, the earlier that anybody can work on tolerating any of the distress that goes along with those diagnoses, the better that they're going to do in the long run. So the main takeaway from today, use your skills, face your anxiety, learn to sit with it, don't avoid, and reach out to your supports for help if you need it. So if you're struggling, reach out to your parents, reach out to your teachers, let them know. You have so many people who care for you and who want to support you. And just like that, even though we might not know you yet, we're here for that as well. So take a look at our website, reach out to our clinic, and we'll be happy to help you in any way that we can.